Patrick clicked in to College Volleyball Weekly on Viral Volley Media. Now here's your host, Rob on Mike. Good day, everyone, and welcome to College Volleyball Weekly Men's Top 20, Episode 16 in what's coming into the postseason for most of our coaches on the team, but are on the screen. But the show's gone off the rails today. We're missing our EIVA representation. Jay got let go. No, actually, he's in a conference meeting. Then we got two coaches, which can be really weird, have to face each other in the quarterfinals of their tournament. And one coach on the screen whose season has sadly come to an end. And because of that, he's gone into remorse and shaved his beard. So with that, there's still a lot of volleyball to talk about in what we're calling the March to Mayhem episode because it's still going. The other conferences are back in action. So we are always going to start with the elephant in the room. And I'm going to have to go to our now clean shaven representative on the screen, Dan Lewis, a friend. Uh, again, dead friend of Lewis. I'm off the rails already. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess uh, I could talk about uh, or Lewis's. We had a tough loss at Ohio State. They played well. I thought we battled. You know, we lost first game 26 24 and won the second. And uh, but you know, I think a couple guys on their team raised their level. Uh, you know, certainly Jacob Pasteur was serving the ball at 70 plus a few times, and so tough guy to slow down sometimes. And he may not be fully healthy, but he's healthy enough to do that. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah, I said, uh, so ultimately Ohio State advances. And then you've got, um, you know, Ball State uh, one over Queens. Uh, you still didn't see Patrick Rogers on the floor yet. So it'd be interesting to see if he pops in uh, this coming uh, semifinal match for those guys, because I think he's an important piece. But Trevor Phillips stepped in for him a little bit. Uh, you saw Loyola take McKendry. We knew last year McKendry had made that upset. But actually, <laughs> They were down to their third setter. I, I think uh, Flattery got hurt in that match. So Nikki certainly had a plethora of injuries to go through in terms of lineup stuff and everything. And so, uh, and then the last match you saw Purdue go into Lindenwood, but Lindenwood's on a tear, a seven match win streak, all three pins hitting well above 350 plus and producing some damage. So I think um, Lindenwood can keep that going. They're going into Bull State. So uh, it should be a great match. But our semifinals are set up and uh, should be a, some good volleyball on uh, Thursday. So yep. it'll all be at Bull State. So that'll be a little bit new for us. Usually it's the higher seed hosting, but they're doing a little bit more of a tournament format from that standpoint. Yeah. Well, we'll go to more detail in the other results. So talk about stats of each of the matches, but let's go to the other elephants in the room. Where to go? Hmm. Let's start with Theo Edwards of CSUN. Yeah, we uh, we had a, a good weekend of volleyball. Um, uh, had a split against Santa Barbara. Uh, night one was was at their place and, and actually our first time playing in the Thunderdome, which was pretty cool. Uh, the newly renovated Thunderdome looks absolutely beautiful. Brand new seats, big screen and um, really cool event place to play. And, uh, you know, hopefully, eventually, maybe potentially a Big West Championship hosting arena because it definitely would be a great spot for it. Um but anyways, back to the matches. Uh, night one, Santa Barbara uh, on their senior night uh, played really well. Uh, served in, incredibly tough and I think uh, held us to one of our lower hitting percentages on the year and and specifically had had 14 aces. Uh, you get ace 14 times and passed the way that we did. It made it super tough. Um, in addition to that, Jess Bianchi has continued his uh, tear over the Big West and I think he had 50 of their 100 attempts and uh, absolutely was detonating the ball and did some really, really great things for them. And uh, it was impressive. Tough guy to slow down. And then uh, on night two, they came back to our place and and uh, we got a little bit of redemption and kind of had the the momentum of our senior night. And and for especially for our guys that are in their fifth and sixth seasons, it was a uh, an exciting matchup for them. And uh, we we were able to finally slow Jess Bianchi down a little bit, and uh, all three of our pin hitters really hit well and played incredibly well. Uh, I think Griffin Walters was over 500, Jalen Phillips over 400, and Kyle Hobus over 300. And our serving was much, much better at home than it was on the road. And uh, we're able to pick up uh, 
the final win of our of our conference regular season. So it was a good way to end things off and uh, excited for uh, the Big West Championship in Hawaii. Yep. And that brings us over to Brad Rostrad of UC San Diego. <clears throat> yeah, we had Hawaii come out here uh, for Friday and Saturday night. Uh, we got to host. It was a kind of like a senior weekend um, with our matchup with them. And it was really cool environment in the gym. We had almost 2,000 people both nights uh, in the arena. So um, with just under 2,000 for the uh, senior night on Saturday night. So it was really cool. The volleyball uh, was pretty steady throughout. Um, I think both Hawaii and ourselves, we try to serve in a little bit more and we try to play a little bit more volleyball. So there were some, definitely some impressive rallies, some long plays and um, Hawaii uh, night one, Played well. Uh, their service pressure really got us off our game early on. Um, and it took us a little, little bit to adjust to the pace that they were bringing um, and make some tactical adjustments as, as far as our passers. Um, and really for us, the biggest difference on night one was statistically everything was pretty close, attacking, uh, blocking, defense. Um, but it was really the serving um, and fighting off the service more so similar to Theo where it's just we got ace too much. I think it was 11 aces for Hawaii um, in four sets is going to make it really tricky um, to have to score and earn enough points to come back from that and side out consistently with the team having success like that from the end line. Um, then we got to night two um, where we were feeling pretty good as long as we knew we could manage those those serves that they had. Um, specifically, Tim and uh, Sakanoko were bringing a ton of heat. They were Aaron. Uh, they were airing at a pretty high rate too. So it was just a matter of, could we fight off those aces and could we manage those aces? And um, we were able to do that. We were able to play a pretty sound, well-rounded match across the board, um, slow down their pin hitters. Alakai Todd was just really consistent, really steady, really quality server, really quality swings, really quality blocker. Just was really impressed with his game throughout the two nights um, and seeing him get to perform and, continue to grow this year has been really impressive um but yeah we were able to come out on top and um it was cool for our for our seniors we didn't have any fifth or sixth year seniors we had two fourth years and then one third year senior um <laughs> with Gabe Dyer graduating early um because he's a, a pretty bright kid academically so um yeah it was a really special night and really cool for us we do some more intimate things with our seniors and their families so um, there was a lot going on um, that Saturday, but I did get to see on Saturday as I was changing into my, I call it a monkey suit. I don't think it's technically a monkey suit, um, but my dress shirt um, that I never wear, but uh, I put Welcome on. Welcome to the professional world, young buck. <laughs> <laughs> we coach volleyball for a reason, right? <laughs> not, I'm not, you're not paying attention to me for the past 20 years. And yeah. so I know you know. always look good. So. Him and Worley were always battling in the Miva for the best looking, best dressed coach. So yeah, but before you know, when, Worley got out of diapers, it was me and Bill Ferguson. Just so you know, you know what I mean. So like, <laughs> just to keep things in perspective. So, uh. <laughs> but I was, I did put on the Lewis Ohio State match, and I think the one thing that stood out, you know, and the announcers mentioned it in that match, and and it was like some point in the second set where it's nine to seven or something, and you could see just the heightened sense of urgency from Ohio state. And I think it's a, because of Lewis is just so tough. And if you give them any ounce, they are going to take it. Right. So to finish a team season is, is absolutely brutal. And to finish a team like that season is it takes a lot of maturity and it takes a lot of really good volleyball. And I think that's something like, as we get to this point of the year, you know, you see, within the teams, the respects they have for each other with how they go about, you know, finishing the job. Um, and teams that have that ability to fight if they get one point, two points, and inch their way back is, is so impressive. You know, and I think that was a, as I'm watching that match, that was a constant presence in the gym that I felt that like those coaches at Ohio State, those players at Ohio State were definitely nervous and definitely making sure that there's a, they were taking care of the job and not giving an ounce to Lewis because they knew an inch they could take a mile. That's good stuff. I mean, there's uh, great battles all weekend uh, without a doubt. So 
uh, <clears throat> there are definitely some other matches I wanted to talk about, but I'm going to leave that up to you guys. I would do my elephant in the room, but you know, I wanted to go more into the stats because there's some great performances across the board. Um, so uh, I'm gonna let I didn't throw it out to you guys. What match you guys want to talk about that you saw well, this last week? I mean, Jay's not on here, but I think the the Mason Penn State was big, and I think uh, and ultimately they went five that first night, and Penn State was able to kind of. I mean, Kerr had two uh, twenty plus kill performances in those both those matches, which was key for them. We talk about Kerr kind of being this steady force for Penn State, probably a little even bit under the radar. It'll be interesting to see where his overall national rank stats and where he falls on that platform is maybe being an all-american if not maybe the player of the year uh in that conference you know what i mean and so like and kind of how they vote and everything but two important wins for penn state to secure home and secure that number one seed and uh i don't know win the 75th regular season title for them whatever that might be from that standpoint i have no <laughs> idea so uh but yeah i think that was a key match the other one in the eva uh, was you saw Charleston upset Princeton. We talked about Charleston had a bunch of injuries and, uh, and ultimately they split that series, but, uh, to see Charleston kind of hedge their way back in a little bit, uh, was pretty big, uh, in terms of that. So. Yeah. I thought Kerr solidified himself as Eva player of the year in my eyes, yeah. um, with his numbers, with his consistent performance. And, um, especially during that stretch February or so, where Penn state was struggling a little bit. He was part of it was when he was out. Um, yeah. I think that really, really solidified his case by um, by his performances both nights. Um, but yeah, I thought it was, you know, if you're Jay or George Mason, I think it's a really promising sign that you're right there on the cusp with that team, and you get into, you got to get to the final first. But you get to that final, then anything can happen um, when you play uh, when you play Penn State there. And then uh, I agree with the Charleston Princeton, and that's it, the crazy part is that's going to be a matchup they see in the first round of the yeah. IBA. And um, with the Charleston team that it seems to be getting healthier and seems to have their guys back, and we've talked about it, you know, especially the first few podcasts about how scary that team can be. Um, However, anyway, that's uh, that's a very stressful first round matchup um, for Sam and for Princeton. Uh, so yeah, that'll be a, a very fun and exciting one for us to check out and watch yeah yeah and i think njit and harvard split too and that's the other side of the bracket so i think you're going to see two repeat matches there from that standpoint so well we're blending topics from top 20 results to moving to mayhem so let's just let's all go there then because there's some crazy per performers in the eiva and john kerr is definitely one of them but jay's team was actually up two sets to one i started the broadcast and i had it on while i was watching what was in front of me seeing that, Oh my gosh, Mason's up two one and they're leading in the fourth. And then I had to focus my attention to the match in front of me. And I saw the final, I'm like, Oh, <laughs> they lost the three, two, but uh, you can tell there was a pretty good battle going on in there. Cause what I did see was Omar Hoyos and um, uh, the uh, Jack Bowles, the reigning ABCA player of the week, really trying to go toe to toe with the uh, off uh, with Penn state as a whole. And they were, Playing some incredible ball. It was so entertaining to watch. But in the end, John Kerr, 23 kills, hitting 524 and ace seven digs, four block assists, for totaling 26 points for the match. And what I think is incredible is Owen Rose, the middle who kind of gets uh, got behind Toby Ezeonu, 13 kills and air hit 600, seven block assists, all contributing 16.5 points. So a uh, great match for those guys on Penn State. But gosh, Jay, the, the fighting Patriots, did what they could. I mean, they they left it all out there on night one for sure. But uh, Theo, did you have anything to add on uh, stuff that we saw in the EIVA? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you as you're looking at their tournament and the way that it's shaping up, right? Um, I think this is going to be a really really tough tournament. And you know, looking across the board, it seems to be that way. We already know the Miva and how interesting that situation is and and has been. Um, but looking at the EIVA. I think Penn State is obviously in the driver's seat. They're the number one team, and and they're going to get a chance to host. But I, that Charleston team getting healthy and being in a position where they're starting to build some confidence, I think that's a really interesting team. And it'll be it'll be a it'll be quite a quite a Cinderella story to see what they're capable of doing. And 
you know, I think I think Princeton again. Princeton has a lot of experience, and and we know that Princeton over the last two seasons has made some really great runs late and ended up finding themselves in a, in an NCAA tournament. So they're capable of just about anything too. So I think uh, I think we're we're going to be strapping in for some really exciting EIVA volleyball. Good call. Um, let's go. Uh... Theo, any matches you want to put to attention to our? Uh, yeah, I mean, we got to talk about the Big West, right? I I think, you know, as far as years past, right, Long Beach and Hawaii have been two of the top contenders year in and year out. Um, they're still again in the top three uh, with this team, Irvine, who has been one of the most interesting phenomenons all year in terms of injuries and lineup changes and who's going to set and all of these different kind of back and forth situations. And this weekend was a tale of two home matches, right? Back yeah. to back sweeps for both teams, uh, both Long Beach and Irvine. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think that Irvine had the better weekend. You know, I, I think there was a lot more riding on them finding a way to, to get a win and, and to, at least build some confidence in terms of what they can do and how they match up against Long Beach. But I think us going to Hawaii for this conference tournament and looking at the mayhem that has ensued in the Big West, right? CSUN has has beaten Irvine, has beaten Hawaii. San Diego has has swept CSUN, beaten, taken a match off of Hawaii. I mean, this is really about as much parity as the Big West has seen since its origin. Um, and so going to the islands, I think this is going to be an incredibly exciting matchup um, with some great volleyball and not to mention maybe one of the best uh, venues and and fans to support some of the best volleyball that's been played uh, in this conference. So super, super excited. And this weekend just made things that much more interesting. When do you guys leave? We leave tomorrow. Same. Yeah. yeah. First round games are Thursday. Thursday. Thursday, right? Yeah. Yep. Does it go Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Yep. <laughs> so for the for the for the teams that don't get a buy, you got to win three in three, three days. Three days. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. All right. Uh, good choice. Let's uh, go to another coach. You want to pick a match to, that we can uh, hone in on for some discussion? Yeah. The one for me that stood out was Grand Canyon Pepperdine. I don't think it had much in terms of the implications for the MPSF standings. I think for the most part, it was pretty locked in. Um, but really the piece I was intrigued by was looking at what lineup Grand Canyon was going to go with, um, you know, with really them being pretty locked in in terms of being a top four team and, and being in that mix at the end of the year. Um, and in the NCAA tournament is um, what lineup does Worley and August and um, the two mats over there uh, all uh, come to find gives them the best chance to to win in May, you know, and, and I think it's been interesting seeing that switch to Jared Anderson on the right, Camden Gianni on the left alongside Jackson Hickman because um, their offense has been so potent and so, so strong throughout the year and seeing this adjustment late is um, really exciting that you have a new lineup, uh, a, you know, essentially a new team that comes together where you take all American opposite, you, you move them to the left and try to bring in a, a stud opposite as well off the bench. And so seeing that lineup come together and obviously look very smooth and very efficient against Pepperdine um, as they got two sweeps there at home. It's um, yeah, I think just, trending into the MPSF tournament where it's gearing up towards, uh, you know, you're going to have a tough matchup in the semifinals for Grand Canyon and UCLA, but it's gearing up towards checking out a little UCLA versus Grand Canyon rematch of what we saw a few weeks ago. Yeah. Well, it's interesting is uh, early on in the season, mm -hmm. obviously we knew they had good middles and Rico Wardlow and Cameron Thorne, but towards the end here, Cameron Thorne's really been ratcheting it up. He's finished there that last match against Pepperdine, nine kills, one error, 727. Then on the pins, he had Gianni finish that night hitting 371 and Jared Anderson finishing with 381. So they're just as hot, if not hotter, than the beginning of the season, at least offensively, because they're really firing away. And then you add in a super good middle who's able to throw some uh, imbalance to the, the defense. You know, that 
Jeep Grand Canyon's gonna be a hard one to deal with if you play them. So uh definitely a solid, solid team going into the uh MPSF tournament. Yeah, I, I think you know, to piggyback on what Brad was talking about and and you know, having players that have a lot of experience and can play multiple positions and have the ability and confidence to do so. Camden Gianni on the weekend passed the two three on the three point scale. I mean, a guy that's been playing opposite for a pretty good chunk of his career now. Um, and not to mention hits 470 with both matches combined. Um, the other thing that I think is really impressive, and again, you know, part of the reason why, uh, you know, GCU has been so effective, they got back to getting in system in terms of the way that they've received the ball, but they're serving and the service pressure. Uh, I mean, Hickman scoring at 48%, almost 50%. Anderson scoring at almost 50%. Uh, and then Camden Johnny scoring at almost 45% on the weekend. So in addition to the fact that they got their offense really rolling again, hit 330 on the weekend, uh, they're serving at a really, really tough clip and keeping balls in bounds at the same time. So that team is as deadly as ever. And there might have been a time in the middle of the year where maybe they got a little bored. You know, maybe it was just too much winning. And uh <laughs> Seems like they're refocused and poised to get after it here. That's a good call on Jared Anderson's serve because uh, to me, that was one of the, the factors that I thought they were going with Carter Rogers because he's got a really strong serve and he's been their serving sub for so many years. So I didn't see that about his serve. And um, yeah, that's a really big sign for them to come. I was yeah. surprised when they, I mean, he played against us in Hawaii, if you guys remember, we were up 2-0. And I'm surprised they didn't stick with it sooner, just right after that. Do you know what I mean? In terms of that, just um, he was pretty impressive against us and really was kind of the turn of that match. And the serving pressure was pretty, pretty darn good at that time. So, well, let's go over to uh, mention some Conference Carolina action here. Uh, and then we'll, we'll continue to talk about the other conferences. But the seating has been set. And I actually just closed out my notes on it, which uh, uh, I'll get up here really quick. But the uh, Belmont Abbey ended up getting number one seed, North Greenville, the two. Uh, at the three, Erskine, and the four, Mount Olive. Five was Barton and King with the six, with the quarterfinal rounds starting tomorrow, as a matter of fact. So uh, what we do know about the Conference Carolina is last year, King made a great run through their conference tournament. And uh, behind uh, Warren Davis, uh, the little engine that could. You know, list them at 6'2", I give him a six foot at best. But he flies and he creates so much havoc. Um, and I can see that happening again, creating some havoc through that conference tournament. But what do we know about the uh, rest of the teams and that tournament? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in my eyes, right, take it away. <laughs> I think you see Belmont Abbey just continuing to dominate. Being 13 and 1 in conference is pretty darn impressive. Um, you know, where. Obviously, everyone's going to have their eyes set on them and be coming to to knock them off. But, you know, I think that consistency and really basically a, being 20 and four or so, I think is right around where their record's at. I think that that sets them up to to be coming out to California here in May. So that'd be my my take on how that conference tournament ends up playing out. Yeah, it's not exciting, but <laughs> I'm not sure you get an upset, but, you know, I could be wrong. It's one of the conferences where I feel like there's certainly a, a little bit of separation with Belmont Abbey. Um, but we know how volleyball goes, so I think uh, uh, I don't have a dark horse right now. I'm kind of picking Belmont, so. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, if there was if there was a dark horse, it maybe it's Mount Olive, right? It seemed like they had some moments in there where there was some promise and some consistency. Um but yeah, I'm I'm with Dan in this. I think Belmont Abbey, uh, if they play well, I think they're the clear favorite, and I think they got a good shot of coming out of this thing and and headed to the NCAA tournament. Yeah, well, in the quarterfinal matchups in the uh, Mount Oliver's Barton, some names to look out for Hayden Freer and Justin Gregory, the primary point scorers for uh, Mount Olive and for Barton, Brandon Johnson and Jackson Dahl, but. One of the names I've been seeing a lot is their setter, Seth Deppie, and he's been running a pretty good show for Barton. In the other uh, quarterfinal that's occurring tomorrow will be uh, for Erskine, Edgar and Austin, and Pablo Zamar are names to look for. And, of course, for King, Warren Davis, and Kellen Kennedy. Um, got to see 
King firsthand last year. And wow, they uh, came in with a lot of heart and they won a lot of fans last year in the uh, opening round of the NCAA tournament. So, um, you know, teams come out to the NCAA tournament, they play and they lay it all out on the floor and it's cool to watch that thing happen. So um, let's jump on to uh, Sayak. Uh, Sayak set up here uh, as well. And they start on the 18th. Number one seed, gosh, my eyes are getting bad. Fort Valley State, number two's Edward Waters, which will not be tournament eligible if they were to win that tournament. So I, I'm assuming, and I think one of you guys can tell me that, if they do win, it goes to the runner-up. Is that correct? The the uh, automatic berth. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. And then uh, the three seed was Central State, four Kentucky State, five Benedict, and five Morehouse. Um, been pretty much uh, Fort Valley State this season, though. And uh, why don't you guys talk about what's going on there? Four, Isaiah eight. Fed. Isaiah Fed. He is a stud. He is. Uh... The best attacker in the SIAC. I mean, I would peg him as SIAC player of the year. He's a top well. serve in the nation after this last weekend, too, at 7.700 uh, aces per set. Took over number one. So, so yeah, I mean, him and Larry Rather's got Fort Valley playing really, really at a high level. So I, I think uh, it's it's great. We're just having such high level in the gym. And at that conference tournament for those teams to be striving to to beat. But I think they're uh they're even heavier favorites than Belmont Abbey is for the Conference Carolinas in my eyes. Yeah. I was just gonna bring up Morehouse got their first win in 46 matches. <laughs> so kudos to those guys, like moving in the yeah. right direction. I think it's somewhere around that stat, but I think it'd been a while, but that's Great for Morehouse, and I know they're working to get better all the time, and so uh, that was great to see. But, yeah, I think I'd go in favor of Fort Valley right now. I think um, Rather's got them playing pretty good at the right time. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just so – it's so cool to remember how young these programs are, right, and and how fast they are evolving. And coaches like Larry Rather, who who obviously played at a really, really high level and, and uh, has coached at a high level and understands – what it takes and the scheduling that that some of these SIAC teams putting themselves in the gym with some of the best teams in the country early on in the year and and just continuing to accelerate where this this uh conference is and and will be it's just fun to see where they're at I obviously think Fort Valley is playing really really great and um it'll be interesting to see in the years to come what that conference looks like because uh, I think it has the potential to be really great well, then Edward Waters has been laying a pretty good case as the best team in that conference. And, you know, they're getting some guys in and some eyes are getting focused on what they're doing in that program as well. Uh, let's, uh, you know, I feel like we haven't said anything about the MPSF. Well, I was I was, I was actually going to go there for you, Rob. <laughs> I was going to head in that direction. Uh, and specifically the Stanford and USC matchups, right? Um, you know, obviously, uh, Stanford did a fantastic job, uh, took it to USC twice this weekend. Um, and it really feels like that lineup with, uh, with Kevin Lamp and, and Will Rotman seeming like he's back to somewhat full strength. And, uh, on night two, having 17 kills hitting 341 and Kevin Lamp adding another 13 kills. Um, you know, that team is really, really old and we've made a lot of jokes about it. Uh, as the year has gone on, they dealt with a lot of injuries um, throughout the the kind of the middle of this season. But coaches around the country knew what that team was capable of, and they've been able to stay inside of the top 10. And um, that's because of how talented they truly are. And so obviously these two wins against USC kind of in the in the right moment of the season is just kind of a, a proof that they're that they're the real deal. And I think that that is a dark horse team that could really cause some problems in the MPSF tournament. So excited to see what that team is capable of doing uh, with all those seniors, all that experience and, you know, coach Costi and, and all of the experience that he has as a coach at that, at the next level. So really cool. Great weekend for them. You know, it's uh they started the season with an opposite with my favorite nickname of the year, Moses Wagner. And I think Jay coined it as Mo Swag. So, uh, you know, he was doing some pretty crazy things in the lineup, you know, in January at the uh, first point collegiate challenge. And then, unfortunately, got an injury, but stepped on in from two years ago. I got to see Teo Snowy 
play and he is legit. And I was surprised. I talked to Kossi. I'm like, you bumped the tail off for, you know, obviously he knew what he was doing because he put Wagner in and they were winning. But Snowy has come in and started dominating, giving uh, Will Rodman a little more space to hit at the left pin. And, you know, <clears throat> I don't think he's 100%, but I mean, I would take Will Rotman at 75% because he's just a point scorer. And uh, Stanford is known to, to, you know, rain on some people's parades and tournament plays. So, uh, you know, a couple of years ago at the uh, at UCLA when they hosted the MPSF tournament, Will Rotman just carried the team on his shoulders and because he's just such a fiery competitor. And uh, one of the reasons I love watching him play because he gets that team going. So anything else on uh, Stanford, uh, USC, MPSF? Let's keep it going. No, just on the MPSF staff, the bracket, do they start Wednesday or Thursday? They go. While you guys look that up, one thing with Stanford, um, it's I don't know if it's been their new lineup, but something over the last like six, eight matches, they've been missing more serves, but they've been getting more aces. So um, it might be a, a tactical change going into the end of the year that they're trying to be a little bit more aggressive from the end line. Um, but you know, on the year they were serving in at like 18%. Now they're up to the 20 to 22% range. Could just be some different gyms and different things going on. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's, it's led to some success and something that, um, will be really interesting to watch. And a team that gets hot from the end line and in an elimination game is, can be really, really scary. Yeah. And to answer your question, they start on the 17th, according to the info sent by Jay, they get to verify that. Uh, but opening rounds or quarterfinal rounds are on uh, Wednesday, the uh, 17th, and then the semis or the, uh, yeah, on the 18th, the next round, the finals on the 20th. Which so is they eliminate uh, CUI, right? They don't make the tournament, right? The, uh, they're oh, right. playing Grand Canyon. UCLA gets the bye. Oh, UCLA gets the bye. That's right. So, got it, got it. So, okay. So, yeah. uh, UCLA finished out the season in a pair versus CUI. And what I thought was interesting is night one, Ethan Champlin led the way, 12 kills, 455, an ace, five digs, and 13.5 points. But um, gosh, Ethan Champlin is, is I mean, he's got to be somewhere just on the outer discussion of player of the year. He's such a great all around player. And it's hard to imagine that he wouldn't be. But you also have Andrew Rowan on that squad, Cooper Robinson. But they handled uh, uh, CUI. They took the uh, weekend 2-0, but uh, there's some really good play coming all around from a deep UCLA bench because on night two, they brought Alex Knight to hit left side instead, and um, maybe uh, uh, Champlin didn't get a good start, but they still were just as effective, if not more effective. But I think we need to talk about UCLA because they're the number two team in the nation. If I'm my guesses are right, there could be a new number one this week. So, But I'm going to bounce it out to you guys so I don't get all in trouble. Well, we, you knew you said I needed to take care of the last two matches, uh, and you knew they were going to. So I think uh, not surprised at all with the results. And we know they're deep, and they know they got a ton of pieces. And uh, I think uh, that consistent lineup for them can tweak a little bit sometimes in terms of the level of play they're playing. And so, but uh, I think they're going to do well in the conference tournament. Do you know what I mean in terms of that? And they're in a good spot to do well. And so, yeah. But I think they could be number one. You could see a little flip in that. Do you know what I mean? Just in, it depends on how the voters vote. So, yep. Yeah, I think it's interesting. The, the one of the one of the characters you didn't mention was Merrick McKendry, right? Oh and, yes. <laughs> well, twelve kills, eight fifty-seven, zero errors uh, on night two, and uh, I mean that guy's just become such a pro in, in terms of the way he's playing the game. I mean, he is he's. He is ready for the next level and seeing the senior class that they're graduating this year. I got to say, I was incredibly excited to see them go. Uh, <laughs> it's been a real pleasure and uh, stoked for those guys to be moving on. Can't wait to see their professional careers because it's going to be truly, uh, truly a thing to admire. These guys, I mean, the players on this team are, are really, really talented and super, super deep. And I think you're right, Rob. I think they could be pushing for a number one seat. Um you know, I think that split between Long Beach is an interesting one, right? It's not like Irvine is is a is a tough is a is an easy team by any means. So well, let's let everyone know that Irvine's oh. easy. It's a walkthrough match for you, okay? <laughs> so they prepare that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the um, you know the uh, earlier in the week on Tuesday I was at UCLA Beach working at an event there, and uh, 
this uh, guy in high board shorts, a stash, and a cap that said UCLA Beach walked out there. I'm like, that's Champlin. <laughs> it looked like he's about ready. Like he, he came out of a, that scene in Pulp Fiction with a banana slug shirt on. <laughs> Are you starting a beach team here, Champ? Or what's going on here? But uh, such a good kid. And uh was watching him messing around on the sand courts. And uh, yeah, he's bouncing them over backstop. So, uh, you know, standing, just standing, you know, with a wrist snap. But um UCLA is a great team to watch. It's, I mean, their team has transformed over the season so many different times because of Libro questions, who's going to play outside, you know, but they've been able to make the adjustments to get those wins that they need to get. Um, one of the teams I want to ask you guys about is because they didn't have a match last week was BYU. How do you prepare with this week off? And I thought that was interesting that they ended up with the week off, but you know, I guess there's an odd amount of teams in the conference. I would have maybe scheduled another team, but then we had that discussion about, do you schedule an NAIA team and then lose and have that, you know, jeopardize, you know, your, your, your record. But I, uh, I mean, I think one for me, I think BYU is, if we see a dark horse out of the MPSF, I think it's BYU. Um, not that they're that much of a dark horse, but they're still six or seven in the country. Right. <laughs> um, but I think for the most part, um, the favorites are going to be UCLA and Grand Canyon as they should be coming out of that conference. Um, but I see BYU potentially being able to sneak in there and um, kind of to your question, Rob, about how you would handle, you know, the week before the conference tournament, it's, it's honestly probably a huge blessing. You get a little bit more time for recovery. Um, you get lots of time to prep and prepare for any and which ways you can end up be playing people and how the tournament can unfold. And then uh, on the last piece for them is they have a deep team. They have a great roster and um, plenty of talent in the gym to where, you know, maybe a Friday or Saturday night, you're playing a exhibition match against yourself, you know, in a, in a, uh, a B versus Y versus U scrimmage uh, or something of that sort to uh, to simulate or keep in that rhythm if, if you want to stay in that same rhythm. Or, but I think uh, for them, they, they're in a really good spot to uh, – I'm excited. Obviously, I don't know who their first round matchup's with, um, but oh, just skip that. Where, where on my bracket, I have them winning that. Um, and then that's a really exciting match between BYU and Grand Canyon in that semifinal um to go on into the final and i, I think that's one that um here's the kicker brad yeah pick on the host usc Ooh, <laughs> and they just lost in five at usc two weeks ago <laughs> so. so interesting storyline could develop out of, well as of no interesting storylines come out of the tournaments right now so but uh, excellent call or excellent answer. Anything else to add? Because if not, I'm going to bounce on over to Dan's conference because I feel like that's the one that has the most instability right now. I was just going to agree with Brad. I think okay. if you asked me if I got the last weekend off before I played conference tournament, I'd be all aboard just so you know. Uh, <laughs> a little bit, little bit extra time to heal and prep and uh, I don't know, the season's a grind. So um yeah, I think, uh, but I think BYU going playing at USC, I would have picked BYU too, but I don't know about that. If USC <laughs> is healthy and they got their group, I think that's going to be a tough place for them to win. So, you know, one thing I noticed on night two of the SC Stanford matchup is uh, Dylan Klein uh, wasn't in, in the second night. I And I didn't get to watch the matches. And uh, I wonder why uh, Coach Nygaard made that change. He went with Duker, Noah Roberts, and uh, – uh, Jackson Reed, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I wonder if there's no implications on night two in terms of how the seed would play out at that point. Yeah, I think it was locked in if I think about it, but could be wrong. Potentially <laughs> just maybe giving him a little bit of a break, um, not putting him through it. But man, if he's, if for some reason he's unable to play, that definitely changes the tournament moving forward. Yeah. At least from my standpoint, seeing the style of play and the power, I think uh, uh, Will Rotman and Dylan Klein are very similar uh, watching them play. And that's why I like watching Dylan Klein play also, because he's just, you know, you throw him a raw piece of meat and he'll chow that thing down on the court. So uh, appreciate that play. Um, so uh, can we jump over to the Miva? Because uh, that's the one that, well, unfortunately, Dan gets to be a spectator and uh, hopefully get to do some commentary some analyst work yeah no, uh, no? <laughs> oh. 
Uh, Dan's out here. pulling out to play beach volleyball. You sure you didn't want to think about that for at least no, like a I split second? <laughs> no, no That's right. Uh, Dan, in case you, all you listeners and viewers are wondering, he had the quote of the day already. But we have to do that in the after dark version because it had an explicit <laughs> word in it. <laughs> uh, well, I think, like I said, I think is Patrick Rogers back? Is he playing the lineup uh, against the hot Lindenwood team who – uh, is playing well, do you know what I mean, in terms of that. And so, um, you know, and that, that's that one matchup semifinal that'll be key. Uh, you know, certainly uh, T is a ph- phenomenal athlete, and uh, they've got some other really good pieces surrounding him. But if Patrick's out there, I think they're in a good spot. If Patrick's not out there, I don't know. If Lindewood shows up, you could see the upset happen in terms of that. Do you know what I mean? They're playing pretty good volleyball, and they feel pretty confident. Connor Sheehan's a senior setter for that group and is doing a nice job. And so... The interesting thing is the libero for Lindenwood might have gotten hurt off celebrations on the match against Purdue Fort Wayne. And oh, I didn't no. see it yet, but I heard about it a little bit. But that would be I'm on the case. You're on the case. Got it. <laughs> and then I think our other matchup, uh uh certainly Ohio State loyal, like at Ball State. And so um that'll be intriguing. I think uh, Parker Van Buren's playing some high level volleyball. Magnum setting that offense a very efficient. Um, you know, I think uh, Loyal is playing some pretty good volleyball right now. And that's not to say Ohio State's not, but uh, if you look over the past month or so, I think Loyal is doing some good things. So um, it should be a great volleyball match. Yeah, I feel like since they announced that Parker was player of the year for the Miva, he turned and went, oh, wait, I'm player of the year? Yeah, let me go ahead and take this to the next level. And uh, <laughs> I mean, wow, that performance. I had an opportunity to turn that match on uh, Loyola against McKendry, and he was absolutely unstoppable. He was uh, a beast against us in that match, yeah. on that last regular season match. And so um, but he's playing well at the right time for sure. So, and hitting well off Dan, you know what I mean? So, oh, big time, big time. So, uh, I'd like to report back. We have a, uh, uh, grade two ankle sprain so he'll be able to play through it um i think he'll be just fine but um definitely was a yeah you see it right away yeah so, wow uh... oh my gosh so, you know brad has coached at many many levels he's been a trainer he has been a coach he has been a sports psychologist the uh... keys to being a good athletic trainer or yeah. to being a good fake athletic trainer because there's you got to make the tape job look good. It's got to look good. It doesn't have to do a ton. Doesn't have to support actually, anything. Just has to look good. effect. Look the part, baby. Just look the part. <laughs> make it until you make it sometimes. Brad, you do know I was a former athletic trainer, right? Certified. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just making sure. Just, That's yeah. why Dan has doubled his salary at Lewis. It's head coach slash athletic trainer. No, no. Not an athletic trainer here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> But he is right about the tape job has to look good. Just so you guys know, it has to look good. <laughs> so I wanted to point out because uh, Connor Sheehan actually leads the nation in assists at 11.22%. And I'm like, man, this he's doing some really good stuff. And with, you know, basically spreading his offense around because you got your schools, you have your big names you go to like Satira Shapanis and Simon Torwe, the Larry Hanno, but he's just throwing it out. He's got such great distribution and he's successful and obviously leading the, the uh, nation. So um, Connor Sheehan has, has been a player I've been wanting to see in person to see what he does. Uh, hopefully, I, well, we'll see NCAA tournament time, but <laughs> maybe I can and watch then, some ball this weekend. <laughs> for me, from the Miva, I think Ball State's just stu- too steady right now. Um, and before I knew about the libero injury, I still think Ball State ends up winning it, but I do think it it's it's a grind. You know, I could see that one being extended to five sets um, and being something that. Ball State's winning 15-13, 15-12 in the fifth set. But yeah. the really the really excited one to me in the Miva is the uh, the uh, Ohio State versus uh, Loyola. I think it's two teams that I think both would feel like their sights have been set on winning this Miva postseason championship and, and have been doing a, a lot throughout the year to get to that point um, and figuring out – what Ohio State ends up putting out lineup wise, because I think lineup wise they've been a little bit more sporadic as opposed to Loyola has been extremely consistent um, with their lineup, especially since Dan Mangum has been back and and healthy and and playing at a really high level. Um, so I think you have the X factors of the Ohio State setter, which it seems like it's a lot more Michael Wright as of late, 
Uh, and then the second outside hitter for Ohio State, and uh, which it seems like it's been more Ben Putnam um, as of late. But um, right, you're going to have an exciting matchup with uh, Jacob Pastor versus uh, Parker Van Buren. And I think those are two of the best players in the conference. And, um, you know, it's always great when you get to see two elite players that can take over that match and, and really showcase it. You know, and ultimately, I think Ohio State ends up edging them slightly. Um, with some more consistency serving. And I think uh, Ohio State libero, whenever I watch them play, he always stands out. I think it's cool. cool. Yeah, Ryan. Is it cool. because of the mullet or is it the mustache that stands out? No, it's because he's good at playing volleyball, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, his game just always stands out. Defensively, he makes he makes yeah. consistent plays, but then in big moments, he's making plays. And I think server receive is really going to be um, a factor that can be massive. Um, for them in this uh, upset, I guess you'd call it, even though the two three isn't much of an upset if uh, Ohio State's able to to take down Loyola. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, one of the offensive uh, contributors as of late for Ohio State, and you just kind of knew that he's just waiting for his moment, um, Shane Wetzel, the oppo, and he's just a big kid at the right side. And he's a you know, before past year came back, he was getting all the point scoring opportunities. And um, if he can take some pressure off of uh, Jacob, that's going to be one lethal offense because he's got a big swing. And then uh, Howard, their middles could be uh, an effective contributor for the Buckeyes. But you did mention Thomas Poole, and he was such an eye catching Libro at the first point challenge. Yeah, you know, I think is just overshadowed by so many other big names in that conference this year, because there've been such phenomenal performances, but um, he's been so solid defensively and in service receive for the Buckeyes. So um, anything else on the, uh, the Miva tournament? No. Oh, and want to add man gun. I mean, you look at how many setters that Hawks has used throughout this, this season alone due to injury, he steps right in. It's like, they don't even miss a beat and actually get even better. Um, and then a Parker Van Buren and obviously player of the year candidate and uh, doing some good stuff too. So um, let's jump over. I, I, we kind of talked about the big West. Do we need to go into more detail of the big West? Uh, I, Cause there are three or four people on here on the big West. So I, I always am sensitive. I'm not talking too much about it. We'll let Dan go. How about that? Talk about the big West. <laughs> well, I, I mean, the tournament's in Hawaii. I already asked, we talked about that a little bit. You got, you know, Theo and Brad hitting it off first round. Do you know what I mean? You got Hawaii's got to play Bianchi and Santa Barbara the first round. I think those are a couple of uh, really great first round matches. Do you know what I mean? With Long Beach and, and Irvine, uh, you know, with the buys. And so I think uh, Hawaii fans are great. You're going to have a lot of great fans out and the crowds will be packed and just some high level volleyball. I th I, I'm not picking a winner right now. It's just like, uh, I, I think Irvine played against Hawaii well out there. Um, you know, uh, I'm not picking a winner against Theo and Brad right now. Sorry, guys. We're not. With you guys. We're I'm not, not doing it. I told Brad he was going to beat Hawaii. I told Theo he was going to win that one a few weeks ago. Do you know what I mean? So How I if I black out Brad and Theo's screens and then you and I just suck? <laughs> I don't know. I think Hawaii's tough to beat at home, but I just don't know that they have the horses to win the tournament at home. Do you know what I mean? And so yeah. and Irvine... And Dave's creativity and the pieces he has, I don't know. And Tyler Hanna, who I think is going to be player of the year, I think everybody's going to have a tough time shutting them down. Do you know what I mean? And, and Sheward plays in Hawaii's crowd, so he's not going to get rattled at all. So he's home, you know, for him. So, yep. Um, I don't like you didn't pick Irvine. Was that reading into it or is that? I, Brad, your, I don't know. Is that what you're locking Brad, in? Do you into it? Do you know what I mean? So, like, well, I do have to mention on Irvine's side, you know, if Will Darcy, who has been their number two, well, actually Nolan Flex is back in the lineup, but Will Darcy has been that number two guy behind Aliriano. But I'd actually argue after Friday night, he was the number one guy because Heno got 14 kills, hit 370, but Darcy had 13 kills, only one error and hit 750. And uh, Long Beach had a hard time stopping him because he's hitting over blocks and uh, he, that same Darcy didn't show up on night two, but I think that the uh, senior night uh, emotion and extra energy in the pyramid uh, really kicked up Long Beach's game. And um, you can see the difference. So Skylar Varga on Friday night didn't have that great of a night, but he still contributed. But night two, he really got it done. And the X factor 
well, actually, it's been the factor is Satira Shapani's and Simon Torwey. Well, both of them, because I mean, creating havoc and getting points out of that havoc is now synonymous with Satira Shapani's. Seeing the way that he plays, and if you're an as- aspiring outside attacker, he will not let you get a free ball. No matter where that ball is at, if he can jump, he's going to hit that ball with pace and make sure it's hard for you to get it back over the net. And you know, there are balls that are 20 feet off the net. I'd see him look at the defenders, step close, take a big rip, and get the point out of it. Or he'd see three blockers up. He's very Henno-esque or Cypriot version of Henno and tool blocks or wipe it off blocks. But he creates so much havoc when he's on offense and getting points for Long Beach. And I'll have to say congratulations to Aiden Knipe as well. 3,000 career assists. And, uh, you know, yeah, he's had great attackers, but, man, you've, you've got to be able to put the ball in the right spot for your attackers to be successful. So congratulations, Aiden Knipe, and uh, great accomplishment. Mason Briggs closed out a season at Long Beach State as well. And I know he's on a milestone. I just can't remember off the top of my head. So <laughs> um, anything else on Big West? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in really quick. Um, I think for me, the most important thing to say going into this Big West Conference Tournament is um, I got to see Theo's bracket, and I know there's a lot of Hawaii faithful fans that uh, that are uh, listening to the podcast or check it out, and we appreciate it. And um, he actually emailed over his bracket to me, um, and he obviously picked Northridge to beat San Diego, which – I have the opposite of, but um, he also had Santa Barbara to beat Hawaii. Um, and I just, I mean, I didn't have that in my bracket. Um, so I just want to make sure the Hawaii fans knew that. So if they do end up showing up to the arena early, you know, San Diego didn't have that pick in their bracket. Well played. Brad, Brad that is a fantastic play. That is a fantastic <laughs> play, especially considering that your bracket doesn't even have Hawaii in it. I thought that was great. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't I'm kind of calling an audible here. Um at largest. What do you guys think could happen with the at large situation? It's too early or don't want to even go there? Well, uh, I mean, it's coming out of the Big West or MPSF and we've got two, right? Yes. Uh, I don't know. I, I think it matters who's in. If like Long Beach were to get upset, like early, or UCLA gets upset early, they're in it. But if both those are in the final and they both get upset, then I think both of them still go. Do you know what I mean? But if they both get it and say they win their tournaments, and you've got two spots left, I think that's certainly where it gets a little bit stickier. But I, I think if you had to pick some candidates that are in the wheelhouse, it'd be like. Irvine's in the wheelhouse, GCU's in the wheelhouse, Hawaii's in the wheelhouse. Uh, and those are probably my three main three that would be kind of in that mix. You know what I mean? If Penn State gets upset, Penn State doesn't go. If Ball State gets upset, they don't go. So, yeah. I think it might be that way for Hawaii, too. Could be. I, I don't disagree. I think, you know what I'm saying? Good job, Brad. Way to way to take care of it. <laughs> yeah, well, but but I think it's Brad's fault. I think that's probably yeah. actually. Irvine can blame you and me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, yeah, I think you're right, though. I think you got UCLA, who most likely is shooing irregardless of where it goes, regardless or irregardless, depending on your grammar from a – Jay, from a Jay will get you on that one. But but you got UCLA and then you've got Grand Canyon is definitely on the bubble there. Um, Long Beach, I think, is no matter what, uh, I think they're in. Uh, I think they definitely are going to take it irregardless of the result. Uh, <laughs> but I think the MPSF gets a little bit more challenging. Um, you know, I think once you once you get past Grand Canyon, um, you know, BYU maybe maybe would be a good candidate. I don't. BYU has to be Grand Canyon to to get in yeah. that conversation, and I still don't know if they're even if that's enough. It's yeah. It's, oh, Grand Canyon's body of work is still good enough. Like I mean, oh, I know yeah. they lost a couple matches, oh, but yeah. So I think if they make, the, I think if Grand Canyon makes an MPSF final, they're in. Oh, they're in. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think it's the early upset for them that would be tough. Right. Wow. 
could be really messy. They get in, or it could be, or it could be really clean. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, it could I, be I think clean. I think chaos we'll scenarios. Grand Canyon wins MPSF, and then, like, let's say Northridge or San Diego makes a run, wins the Big West, and that's gonna be ugly. <laughs> Um, with that, I know we are actually running long, believe it or not, and we don't even have Jay here. He hasn't left, in case you guys are all wondering, just in a conference meeting this morning. Um, who are your players of the week? We'll go uh, with... John uh, Kerr. Go, go. Uh -huh. go first. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when you're out, you're faster. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Brad. Who? Parker Van Buren. 18 kills, no errors. Hit 700. That's okay. All right. Theo. Yeah, I uh, I don't know if I've done this before, but I got to put uh, Griffin Walters in there. He hit over 500 on night two uh, for us against Santa Barbara. And on his senior night, and, uh, you know, that guy has been through quite a lot of things from behind the scenes. And uh, it was pretty impressive to see him come out and really play well. So Griffin is one. And the other one is uh, Anthony Sherfan. That guy had a heck of a weekend, man, and that win over Hawaii. And they're really, really grooving right now and playing some great volleyball. And um, this tournament is going to be a lot of fun. Theo's butching Brad up for the matchup. It's like, oh, you know, Theo's well, not that bad of a dude. I, hey, I, I, said, listen, I Rob, listen, Rob. Theo doesn't Rob, we're, we're, we're just, just the, the underdogs, underdog, you know. And by the way, just so nobody says anything, I'm going to do one of Brad's guys, and I'm playing him. So I'm just going to work the whole scene right now. So, like. <laughs> Hey, listen, awesome. listen, we're just underdogs. Brad already beat us twice. We just walked <laughs> into this tournament. I'm going to put one more guy. Yeah, I uh, love this podcast, by the way. This is just uh, too much fun. Nathan uh, Litsky from Stanford. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put him up. He he was pretty good for them uh, and had 50-some assists the second night. And so, like, anyway, so I thought he did a nice job in helping them secure two wins. Excellent call. I'm going to drop one in there because I like the unsung heroes, but I got to throw Simon Torwe in for Long Beach State all year long. I just feel like he's been overshadowed by other performers on the team, but he's been consistent, not only defensively, but offensively. They get that middle running through him. He freaking hits the ball so hard and blocks a ton of balls, comes out of the blocks in the most key moments. So uh, I'm going to drop the uh, Spaniard slash German Simon Torwe of Long Beach State in the middle. So, uh, next week, wow, we would have had the turn the selection show already by our um, next recording. Um, it's going to be an exciting week of tournament action. Be sure to follow. I'm going to drop some names here. Volleyballmag.com has the schedule or off the block, whichever. Just go support the game. Go watch these matches. It's not that much to get that $5.99 subscription on ESPN+. Plus. I Now, Flow, that's a different story. I'm like, how much for the month? <laughs> but still, it's the MPSF tournament. Um, they'll be broadcasting all of those. And is Big Ten doing EIVA tournament? That Big Ten Plus or whatever? I That guy got to look. But be sure to check all those sites for the listings. Um, as always, uh, and I need to add, I created some brackets. I sent the PDF to the guys on the screen. I may make it available on Volley Talk. I just, I can't manage a pool right now. So <laughs> there's a whole lot going on these next three weeks for me. I'd love to do the points and have fake prizes, but you know, we can just do it for pride and uh, I'll be sure to get that on there. Uh, there's one more piece of business I'm forgetting here off the, you know, that I'm, that's pretty important, but Oh yeah. So we're going to do a mini J addendum episode tonight. So this will be out by the time Jay gets to watch it so he can brag on, uh, or brag or beat on these guys here. <laughs> um, but I want to thank uh, Theo Edwards of CSUN, Dan Friend of Lewis, and Brad Rothschild of UC San Diego. As always, excellent discussion. And we actually went off the uh, note topics that I sent out to you guys that never made it out. So, um, hey, uh, good luck to the two that are active. Dan, good luck to everyone Jay but Brad. Beach Volleyball. Uh, and hang with man. Ray and the crew. You're going to do it. Took it. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks again. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for listening to College Volleyball Weekly. Be sure to follow Rob Espero at the Rob on the Mic on Instagram and at Rob on the Mic on Twitter. <laughs>